Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. Today we will be discussing the older god, Sylvian, and the nature of her love, her magic, the bunny masks, and the marriage of flesh. While there are parts of her lore that depict her as a fertility goddess, the primary focus Orange has is on physical love, reciprocity of love, motherhood, and the literal uniting of body and soul. Sylvian is better described as the uniter to Grogoroth's divider. As previously explained in my past video, Grogoroth is the god of free will, but in Sylvian we find a dominating and directing influence from mankind. One I believe to be largely negative. For the love of Sylvian is not of the higher forms of love as we know it. Her answer to the sorrow of existence is in the reversion of the two, or more, into one. This is an understandable motivation for a mother, but ultimately it stunts humanity. There is an undercurrent to the lore and story of fear and hunger that humanity must move forward out of the shadow cast by the old gods, and Sylvian is one of the old gods who most typifies it through her domineering motherhood. Astute players of Fear and Hunger will likely connect Sylvian with the worship of mother and fertility goddesses from ancient times. The studies of Sylvian in Fear and Hunger 1 describe Sylvian as the goddess of creation, who created men and women at the dawn of time, who are referred to as her children. Her statue in Sylvian Square in Prehevel simply reads, For Fertility and Prosperity. Furthermore, her depiction in the studies in the first game resembles the statue of Diana of Ephesus, a version of the goddess of nature, Artemis, who has typically been associated with fertility, especially in the Ephesian context. There is in fact an academic debate whether the orbs hanging from her are breasts, or perhaps are instead testicles or grapes or fruits. Whichever the answer, the Diana of Ephesus was clearly a god associated with the fertility and prosperity of life so it's not hard to see where Orange got his inspiration. Another feminine element of Sylvian is the prominent vaginal imagery on her statue outside the mines in the first game. However, this statue complicates things. It clearly has phallic imagery as well. Her hair resembles the glands of a penis, and the Sylvian square statue is equally phallic. This is all to say, Sylvian holds the generative powers of both male and female inside her. She is hermaphroditic. Players may be inclined to believe that Grogoroth is the male father to Sylvian's female mother, but this is not the case. Humanity sprang from Sylvian without the need of a father, as Sylvian is male and female. This is because Sylvian represents life itself, without specific reference to or favoritism of either sex. When we use the magic of life, healing or loving whispers, we are passing on Sylvian's love for humanity. The skills are described as Concentrated whispers carried out by the older god Sylvian. When we use healing magic, we are acting as a conduit for Sylvian's love. The old gods are natural forces, pure concepts that humans channel for magic. The human will of the mage is united with the great love Sylvian holds for humanity. Divine and human will unite. The mage acts upon the substance of life and brings healing into reality. Even though Sylvian has departed, her love and the essence of life itself is clearly still part of the world, just as Grogoroth's violence remains. Unlike Grogoroth's power, however, Sylvian magic specifically unites Sylvian's love, her substance, with the mage's will. 
If Grogoroth's magic was a tool set of knives, files, and hammers, then Sylvian's magic is like a cake that first must be unwrapped by the mage, and then portioned out to the recipient. Grogoroth is void, but Sylvian is substance. Grogoroth is no space, but Sylvian is space. I will not repeat all I've already said on Grogoroth, but Grogoroth's magic is the magic that rips into the world, hurting and black orb tear through flesh and space, respectively. Note how Grogoroth is not invoked in the description of his own magic. Hurting is described as being formed out of your concentrated feelings of hurting and hatred, and Black Smog's description also implies its man-made nature. Grogoroth's will is irrelevant, he does not actively target his destruction. But Sylvian's love for humanity is targeted. She loves all of us very deeply, and humans can use her whispers. Perhaps they are the lingering echo of the sweet things that she must have whispered to her beloved children at the dawn of our species, as a mother does to her newborn babe. Besides the hermaphroditic imagery, players will notice the clear cosmic horror tones of Sylvian. When people think cosmic horror, they think of a horrible mind-blasting nightmare that has many tentacles and pseudopods, a la Cthulhu. Sylvian's traces are definitely the closest of the old gods in resemblance to mainstream cosmic horror. In her, we find two of H.P. Lovecraft's fears united, the pelagic and the sexual. Sylvian's appearance is perhaps the most consciously cliched of Orange's old gods. A great, tentacled beast rising from the depths of the green. Lovecraft nursed a deep-seated fear and disgust at the sea and its inhabitants. I have hated fish and feared the sea and everything connected with it since I was two years old, but I cannot recall what earlier experience gave me such a profound and lasting aversion the sea and seafood. Sylvian's design clearly harkens to the sea as the source of all life on our planet Earth. Mollusks are among the oldest animal inhabitants of our planet. If Sylvian is the mother of life, in general, as the old god creation, then there is perhaps no better real-world event to compare it with than the Cambrian age of our planet. The Cambrian period was a great explosion of life. Animals like cephalopods and the famous trilobites burst onto the scene. Of course, the vast majority of life in the Cambrian age was aquatic. Life first developed in the oceans before moving out onto land. Look at the area we find Sylvian in. The void calls to mind life on primordial Earth. The blights are clearly inspired by the giant reptiles that once ruled, while the rocky surroundings appear to have imprints of fossils of unknown life forms. Sylvian literally pulls herself up out of the green soup of creation to grasp us. The old gods are unfathomably old and Sylvian as the concept of life itself would have seen many beings come and go well before humanity was even a twinkle in her eyes. The pelagic association itself can be tied to the sexual. The redo model of Sumerian myth, which sprung from Sumeria's southern marshes and lagoons, assumes the primacy of water when it comes to creation. The god Abzu and the mother goddess Namu are associated with the mud marsh which teems with life. He offer notes that heterosexual mating is not part of the metaphor of this model, but nevertheless, there are erotic connotations. Marshes were a locuses of sexual encounters, and the theme of abundance, moisture, soft mud, all have overtones of feminine and autoerotic sexuality. We might be able to connect this with Sylvan's plastic tones. Her boss form is that of a horrifying skeletal squid and her statue in Prehevel calls to mind mollusks and annelids, creatures which thrive in the wet, fertile grounds of marshes and coasts. In Lovecraft, the connection between the pelagic and the sexual is most obvious in his short story, The Shadow of Her Innsmouth. The Deep Ones represent a sexual intrusion of a racial other to society. There are other sexual elements in Lovecraft that deserve mention. In his essay, Supernatural Horror in Literature, he asserts that much Western horror lore was related to the hidden presence of a cult, descended from nomadic Eurasians who influenced the revolting fertility rites of immemorial antiquity. 
Lovecraft believed this survived in Europe through secretive peasants cavorting on witches' sabbaths in the woods and hills, well after Christianity. This is phrased less sensitively in the actual essay. Orange's work lacks any racial elements intertwined with the sexual horror. The only connection we can find between Lovecraft and Sylvian is the pelagic element and the idea of isolated sexual rights that take place outside of urban areas, a la the bunny mask meadows. However, the bunny masks have very little to do with witches' sabbaths, or even fertility rights as such. Rather, we must look farther afield for the connections and meanings of the sexual trance of the meadows. Sex and violence are two of Fear and Hunger's greatest sources of imagery. Both are assaults on the senses. The exertions of a prison guard as he charges you down and pummels you to death. The obnoxious sounds of coitus found within Kahara's dream of a brothel. The harvestman's soft whistling before he invades your orifices. But one curiously stands out for its total silence. I'm referring to the Bunny Mask Meadow in the grassy courtyard of the dungeons. Its counterpart, the Cave of Wolf Masks, is not silence at all, but our player character can remark that the Bunny Masks are silently going at it. We can tie the silence of the Bunny Masks to the Karma Mudra, a Vajrayana Buddhist technique for using sexual bliss to give spiritual insight. In a textual study of Tibetan yoga and mysticism, the actions of the Karma Mudra are described in detail, that's I will not be going into here, but the main point is that the male participant must remain in a meditative state without ejaculation, altering their inner elements to achieve a higher state of tranquility meditation. Note, no corresponding instruction is provided for the female participant. Judith Simmer Brown writes that self-gratification cannot have any place in Karma Mudra, Rather, the technique is for the examination of one's own thought, and the motivation must be to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all. Key to this is the lack of sexual release, and the bliss that mutually fills both bodies. The bliss leading to a radiant clarity of mind. With the bunny masks, the bliss remains. Indeed, our player character remarks that we can feel the love the bunny masks have for one another. But we can see there is no sexual release only a continual trance-like state of bliss and coitus, which brings one closer to Sylvian, while also healing our wounds, likely for the radiating love of the trance. The trance totally insulates the participants from the world, and your playthrough is at a risk of a game over if you fail a coin toss. The trance becomes a grim parody of the meditative practices of self-denial, through starvation and exposure to the elements, by being lost in an endless lust. Also within Tibetan Buddhist art and sculpture is the representation of the Yabyum, or Hevjara. The union depicted represents the marriage of wisdom and method. The bell associated with the female represents wisdom, while the second object, the Darja, or Vajra, represents method. The consummation of the two results in enlightenment, because once the two are joined, there is the recognition that there is no barrier of otherness. The two are united. Wisdom is method, and method is wisdom. As Pallas says, anyone who has read the Heart Sutra will see the parallel implications. As for Sylvian, there are two elements to be recognized of the Yabium. The first is that the pose taken by Grogorov and Sylvian in the God Manifesto is very similar to both Yabium iconography and the union of Chakrasambara with a Dakini, displayed prominently in images from the Chakrasambara Tantra. The male has both feet planted on the ground, while the female is cradled and hanging from the male. While Grogorov is stretching his arms out indifferently, Sylvian is cradling herself with her tentacles and hangs off her partner with ecstatic bliss. The male deity within the union is sometimes identified as Sri Heruka, also known as Samvara. Heruka is seen as a fearsome entity who cleanses the cosmos to pave way for Buddhahood. He is as fierce as the end time of great destruction. Greatly blazing, his voice blazes, like a charnel ground fire. 
He has a crown of skulls, fierce like the end time of great destruction. With his blazing gaze and dance, he incinerates the triple world along with Rudra, Mahadeva, Vishnu, the sun, the moon, Yama and Brahma, reducing them to ash. Samvara cleanses the world to prepare it for the awakening of Buddhas in purified Buddha lands. He paves the way to enlightenment. It doesn't take much reaching to see the connection between the wrathful Samvara and Grogoroth. And indeed, the union of Sylvian and Grogoroth does pave the way for enlightenment, as their union creates Vanushka, who has rightfully been associated with enlightenment by many players of fear and hunger. I shall save specifics for a later video, but Vanushka's meditative pose in the skin bible and the eye within the triangle point towards a link that bears further study. While we have discussed the marriage of wisdom and method, there is a much more important marriage that must be discussed within the context of fear and hunger, the Sylvian marriage. The Sylvian marriage is likely one of the first shocking discoveries seen by a new player. Sexual intercourse that gradually morphs into a Cronenbergian horror show of melting and melding flesh. It certainly makes an impression. But it would not do to let the shock cloud our minds on the meaning behind it. In Plato's Symposium, the playwright Aristophanes describes the original form of humanity. There were three genders then male, female, and the third, which was a combination of the two. All humans were rounded in shape, with four hands and four legs and two faces and two sets of the sensory organs. Essentially, humans were spheroid entities tumbling around on our limbs, cartwheeling. Despite this ridiculous locomotion, they made war on the Olympian gods, but the gods did not wish to eradicate them since they desired honors and sacrifice. So. Zeus cut humanity in two to weaken them, but the two separated halves rushed to join one another, as if to form a single living being. This led to many expiring from hunger and inactivity, so Zeus ordered the genitals so that the meeting of the halves would result in sexual intercourse. Simply put, human sexual desire arises from trying to heal the wound inflicted on us by the gods, and to unite into a single fleshy being once more. The marriage shapes man into a hermaphrodite, like a repairing of the primordial bull humans. The melding reflects Sylvian's own image. Of course, it must be stated that not every marriage of the flesh is heterosexual. Two men can form a marriage just as two women might. But the default image for the marriage in Fear and Hunger 1 is a person with an androgynous bald head, a single breast, and a penis. Clearly hermaphroditic. Overuse of the marriage will create an abominable marriage, whose penis will fail to reach erection, and so is rejected from taking part in the Bunny Meadows. Evidently, the Bunny Masks see no point in simply using your character as a receptacle. Rather, you must be physically potent as well to be able to take part in their rites. As outlined previously, the trances of the meadow require giving and receiving pleasure. The impotency of the abominable marriage is the great irony of Sylvian. Her desire to shape man in her image, when twisted, results in abominations that are cut off from that essence of life. Sex. Perhaps this is intentional. Once a marriage is in a state of unity with its constituent persons, they can never be alone again. But if Sylvian is seen as an overbearing mother, our desire to gain greater affinity with her cuts us off from meaningful connection by stunting our personal development. One becomes inward facing. And despite the presence of both generative powers, as a hermaphrodite, impotent. It does not explain to us exactly what Sylvian's twisted love is, but this side of the marriage is the most likely culprit. Sylvian is still a creator of both generative forces. She is not at risk of her own love. Indeed, her boss fight features her morphing a tumor into a copy of one of the player characters. But note, that the brief age of Sylvian is described as a sea of nude people pulsating in coitus. Not to generate new life, but only to waste away the days. This is the irony of Sylvian. She is the creator, 
but when her attention is focused most acutely, all that is left is lust and impotence. Life energy expended for no purpose but itself. This is most at odds with the imagery of pregnancy and birth that Orange supplies throughout Fear and Hunger 1. The motherhood of Nilvan is characterized by a willingness to create something new. Nilvan's status as a good mother is somewhat debatable, to put it mildly, but at the very least, she was attempting to create something that would exist outside of herself and potentially outlast her. She was a new god, creating an ascended one. Meanwhile, Sylvian's love for her children is a narcissistic, self-aggrandizing love. Perhaps it was not always the case. Maybe the whispers of her magic are the genuine feelings she conveyed to her newborn. But note that loving whispers in Terminal is described as being solely based on Sylvian's whims. And if we reach negative affinity with her in the first game, we can create a failed marriage. On the meaning of Sylvian's love, we turn to our final topic, the theory of love. Ultimately to Sylvian, love means the connection of individuals to something greater. In the state of togetherness, there is no longer the anxiety, shame, or guilt of separatedness. Sylvian is the answer to the question of oblivion separation and pain, Grogoroff. As Eric Fromm says, when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they became truly human, emancipated and separate from nature. Their covering of themselves is not the statement of a prudish morality, but an awareness of their separation from nature and each other. Before, the thought never crossed their mind. The awareness of human separation, without reunion by love, is the source of shame. It is at the same time the source of guilt and anxiety. He continues regarding infants. Inus has developed, but not fully matured yet. Their anxiety is cured by proximity to their mother, sucking her breast, the feeling of her skin. As the child develops, the presence of the mother does not become sufficient for all degrees of curing separateness. Sylvian's motherhood of humanity is unsettling. Her realization that her children could never return her love to her led to her love being twisted. She wished to shape mankind to be more in her image. I have already stated the evidence for this. The bunny masks, the marriage, and the age of Sylvian. I believe Sylvian's obsession of controlling humanity revolves around her wishing to extend the mother-child relationship as long as possible. Enki's Skin Bible and the studies of Sylvian describe her love as blossoming into an obsessive form over time. And both refer to Sylvian trying to guide or control humanity, which Enki describes in a parental way. I believe the growth of humanity took it away from Sylvian's guidance. A child cannot stay in the cradle forever. The bond of love between a mother and her suckling child is extremely powerful but Sylvian's love is distorted. As Eric Fromm describes with the story of Jonah and God, God explains that the essence of love is to labor for something else, to make it grow. And the mother does it by the isolation she endures in behalf of the family. Of the Motherhood is a sacrifice. On our uh, veranda in Hawaii, uh, there, uh, there are uh, little birds that come that Gene likes to feed. And uh, each year there have been one or two mothers, mother birds. And uh, if you've ever seen a mother bird plagued by her progeny for food, that the mother should regurgitate uh, their meal to them. And the two of them, or five of them in one case, flopping all over this poor little mother, uh, they bigger than she in some cases, uh, you just think, well, this is the symbol of motherhood. This is, is just giving of your substance and everything to this progeny. Sylvian loves her labor of love, perhaps more than the target of her love. She desires love to continue forever and ever. Lending credence to this, Sylvian has a hedonistic streak. Disturbingly, Sylvian's worship and magic has hints of sensory addiction. By Termina, she has either degenerated or departed from the world so much 
or Sylvian worship has advanced so, that masturbation can give us affinity with her, which it did not in the first game. Sylvian wants to extend the experience of pleasure as much as possible, regardless of the end result. The desire to extend her loving and pleasure indefinitely leads to a key point. Sylvian lacks a core element of love, as Fromm describes, for responsibility could easily deteriorate into domination and possessiveness were it not for a third component of love, respect. Herein lies the main issue. Sylvian lacks respect for her creation. She may know, care, and be responsible for her creation, but it is the critical element of respect that she lacks. Sylvian does not desire humanity to blossom in its own particular and unique way, ironic given her magic is called the flower magic. Respect can only exist on the basis of freedom. To love another means to feel one with him or her, as they are, and not as an object for your use. Fromm identifies two elements to a mother's love. The unconditional affirmation of the child's life and needs, he refers to this as milk, the second element is the affirmation of life and loving being alive in this world. This is the honey, the sweetness of life and the desire for the child to remain alive. If a mother is too focused on the milk, there is the risk of the mother's love being a satisfaction of her narcissism. The child, being helpless and completely subject to her will, is a natural object of satisfaction for a domineering, possessive woman. Here we find the critical element of Sylvian. The paradox at her heart. The very essence of motherly love is to want the child's separation from herself. This is contrasted to erotic love, where the two who are separate become one. Motherly love makes the two who are one separate. Only the really loving woman, the woman who is happier in giving than in taking, who is firmly rooted in her own existence, can be a loving mother when the child is in the process of separation. This is Sylvian's great fault. Her love can never lead to the truest form of motherly love. Love for what the child will be outside of the mother. We have already discussed the marriages and the meadows, but another rite of Sylvian, Demon Seed, evidences this. Nashra specifically describes that the product of Demon Seed will create a son that will live a life of violence. The blue demon child is a pure tool for the player. It has been tainted by the touch of the older gods, according to the creation of life too. The blue demon is raised to live a life of violence. The transformation into a tool is a form of Sylvian's twisted love. The blue demon is willing to do anything you ask of it, with only some discomfort seen when sold to Pocket Cat. Even in death it serves, acting as a powerful nasally administered narcotic which may call to mind the orgiastic trances of the bunny masks. Even Sylvian's greatest magic, the rebirth of the beloved, can only create a twisted mockery of the object of the user's love. Definitively then, Sylvian's love is the love that unites, that brings flesh to flesh and makes one flesh. But it is a love that consumes and distorts. Sylvian's love is not the love of love thy neighbor, Sylvian is Eros. Sylvian is the love of a mother for her child. Sylvian is the literal uniting force, the glue that holds all things together rather than splitting them apart, as is Grogorov Station. But Sylvian is not agape, or the love of one's brother, Philia. Sylvian's love is physical sensation and intimacy. To find love, love of the spirit, we must look somewhere else. Do you hear them? Bells of the Ascended One? What do they herald? Is it love that we search for? But perhaps, it is hate that we find. Thank you for watching my video. I'm sorry this took so long to get out. Frankly, I didn't really have a good idea of what to talk about for Sylvian until fairly late into the planning stage for this video. Sylvian seems way more straightforward than Grogoroff, but I hope you enjoyed the end result. Please let me know what you think. The next video will be on Ulmer, the Ascended One. Please look forward to it. Thank you for watching and goodbye.